right? Okay, so there's some big words in math that we use a lot. Today we're going to use, like we talk about solve. You know, we say the word solve a lot in math. That means something very particular when we say solve. I'm not going to deal with that today. There's a lot of stuff to talk about when, when we're talking about solving things. Today we're going to talk about this word. Simplify. See that a lot in math. We'll tell you to simplify this expression or simplify this, simplify that. What's that mean? And it's kind of almost says it in the title. What are you trying to do when you're simplifying something? Make it as simple as possible. That's it. You're making it simple. Simplifying is to make simple. So what if we have a bunch of numbers? Like let's take for example something like this. What if we had oh three plus two times four? There's a lot of, you know, not a ton, but there's a lot of writing there. In its simplest form, what is this going to look like? You're going to get so What is it that you're going to get back? What are you going to put into Moodle when it says simplify this in the answer box? I don't care if it's specifically, but what they just described, what it generally, what's it going to be? But okay, but you're going to, I'm going to have you give me back the simplified version. And so is it going to have all those... What's it going to be? What's it going to be, Cooper? What am I going to get back? You're going to get okay. So you're going to you're, you're going to you're giving me an answer to this, but you're just going to get a single number. Is all I'm getting, at, right? A single number is the simplest way to write that expression. Agree? Okay. Okay, so that's our goal. Is just to crunch all this down and get a single number out of it. So let's talk about this a little bit now. How how do we do this again? What what's the answer going to be? Okay, and how'd you get that? What'd you do? Yes, sir. You use, okay, you use PEMDAS, right? So you're using order of operations. You guys know that. You know that we're going to say 3 plus 8 equals 11. But somebody who maybe hadn't taken a lot of math might look at this and they might think reasonably that 3 plus 2 times 4, well, we read books from left to right, so they might say instead 3 plus 2 is 5, 5 times 4 is 20, and they would be wrong. Right? We kind of already got it. The, what tells us the correct order in which to do all this stuff is order of operations, PEMDAS. Right? We have to have that specific kind of an order that we can agree on, or we're always going to get different answers. Right? And so really all we're doing today is we're just going to take a quick review of how do we apply PEMDAS. But PEMDAS gets a lot more complicated than just this. Right? So let's look at some harder examples. It, notice over here the order of operations. They use a G instead of a P. How come? P's fine. If you want to use P, it's fine. It's not just parentheses. It's not just parentheses. It's all grouping symbols, right? So it could be parentheses. It could be brackets. Could be absolute value bars. Could be if you have a fraction bar, everything on top. Right? There's a whole bunch of ways we can group stuff. And so if you're going to make it a P, just make sure that you recognize that it's not just parentheses. That's the most common, but there's other stuff too. E for exponents. How come the M and the D are grouped together instead of writing the M over the top of the D? I mean, why you might have written it like this in the past. What's wrong with this? If I write it like this, I do not like that. Yeah, yeah, that, that would imply that multiplication comes before division. That's not true, right? When you get down to this level, it's all multiplication and division, whichever one you hit first from left to right. If you see division before multiplication, then you divide first, right? Same thing with the addition and subtraction. They're on equal footing, same level, okay? Okay, let's try something relatively simple. Let's try, how about number two to warm up? Everybody, if you haven't done that one, take a minute and just go through it. Okay, so let's go through PEMDAS or GEMDAS or whatever you want to call it. When we simplify, we go top to bottom, right? Okay, so what's the first thing we got to deal with here then? 
you see any grouping symbols? Yes. Alex, what do you see? Absolute, absolute value bars. Right. So the first thing we see is we get absolute value bars here. And so the first step, the parentheses or grouping symbol level step, tells us we got to do what? This, this term right here, instead of being minus the absolute value of negative 8, what is the absolute value of negative 8? 8. So that's going to turn into an 8, right? And then we got times 6 divided by 16. And we've got this 4 cubed out front, right? Okay, so technically, we're supposed to do this one step at a time, right? Agreed? And I'm going to write it that way the first time. Uh, what would our next step be? Exponents. Okay, so we go down to exponents. We see an exponent right there. What's 4 cubed? 64. 64. Okay, probably you get that. You maybe remember that. But if you're, just a quick little hint. When you multiply by 4, what's a quick way to do that in your head? And I'm going to defend mental math for a second. I know probably people just hate doing mental math. It's much easier to just plug it in and calculate it. And I agree. But the brain science shows this is absolutely 100% true. When you look at somebody that's doing mental math, you look at their brain, the parts of their brain that are active, it's exactly the same parts that are active when you do algebra. The kind of um, symbolic stuff you do in your head when you do mental math makes you better at algebra. Okay, so try to, whenever you can, you know, try to do a little mental math. How do you multiply something by 4 easily in your head? Multiplying by 4, if you go through the whole algorithm, that's hard to do. It's a process that's pretty straightforward that makes it simple. I mean, it's, and it's not hard. I mean, it probably it's so easy. You're thinking, wow, this is maybe you already, may already do this, everybody. But if I wanted to multiply 37 by 4, how would I do it in my head? Okay, meaning double it and redouble it. It's easy to double stuff. It's a lot easier. Well, not always easy, but it's easier to double stuff than it is to multiply stuff. So if I double 37, what do I get? 74. Okay. And if I double 74, what do I get? And you can do that. It just takes a little practice. Say it again. 148. Yeah. Okay. That you can do, right? It's hard to think about 37 times 4. You've got to carry stuff. That's too hard. But if you just double it and redouble it, you can do that pretty quickly in your head and pretty accurately. Okay. So 4 cubed, we get 16. 16 times 4, you know, we just double and redouble. 16 times 2 is 32, times 2 is 64, right? Okay, minus 8 times 6 divided by 16. Technically, we got to do this in that order, right? Okay, what's next? Multiply and divide from left to right. So we got multiplication there, don't we? So we get 64 minus, what's 8 times 6? 48 divided by 16. So we still got to do some division. What's 48 divided by 16? 3. three. So I get 64 minus 3 equals 61. That's a lot of steps. Can you think of a way we could have done this? We could have abbreviated that and maybe cut some steps out. You got to be a little bit careful with this, but it's part of math. A lot of what I do in math class, like in calculus by more than anywhere, is just sort of help people think like a mathematician. And there's a, this a different way of looking at things. And so when you somebody that's a knows how to do stuff, kind of talks out loud and breaks down the thinking process for doing stuff like this, it, it's, it, you recognize the patterns. And pretty soon you're thinking that way. So this is one of those times. This is a time when we can we can be a little more efficient with this, and we can be better at doing the math. We can take fewer steps which means it takes less time and we probably have maybe even more accurate work. Did I really technically have to split all these into separate steps? Could I have maybe done this a little quicker? Like if I started this problem over again, let's just redo this and see if we can be a lot quicker about this. Okay, one thing that we know is that in PEMDAS, everybody agree the last step is add subtract. We all know that, right? So when I see things like this, when I see there's a minus sign that's separating this part from this part, those two terms, I know that at the very end of this thing, I'm just going to have to add up what I get from those two terms. Right? So even though technically 
I have to take care of that, uh, that negative 8 first inside the absolute value. So I'm getting minus 8 times 6 divided by 16. Why don't I just go ahead and take care of that exponent out front at the same time? There's no reason not to, right? They're separated by a minus sign anyway. So I could just write that as 64. And then I would say that you could maybe even combine some steps here, right? We know that we're going to have 8 times 6 is 48 divided by 16. I can probably do that in my head. I can probably combine those two steps and just turn that into 48 divided by 16 is 3, right? So I end up with 64 minus 3 is 61 in two steps instead of like 5, right? Does that make sense? Okay, one other issue here. And I know there's a lot of this. Is, we're just talking math here in this first couple of weeks. We're not going to be doing a lot. So, I mean, la later on, the pace will pick up. But there's just a lot of things to unpack here before we jump into new material. Here's something else I want to draw your attention to. This last part, we get this divided by 16. Well, we don't like to use the division symbol. That's kind of middle school stuff. Right? We don't generally do that. It'll show up sometimes. Though. How do we always want to represent division whenever we get a chance, like on paper? Say it again? Over 16. Over 16. We want to make a fraction bar. And when I say fraction bar, I don't mean a slash. I mean a horizontal bar where we get stuff on top and stuff on the bottom. But that brings up a question. If I've got, let's go down to this part right here. I've got 8 times 6 divided by 16. So the question is, and, and this is the part of math that I'm sure you hate, like when there's open questions like, do I do it this way or this way to get to the answer? And, and is it 8 times 6 over 16, or is it 8 times 6 over 16? Or does it make any difference? It doesn't even make any difference. Whichever way you do it, the order of operations are going to work out the same. You get that? When you have stuff like that where you're multiplying and dividing, then not. Doesn't matter. You could put the fraction bar over the whole thing or not. We're going to get the same answer either way. Make sense? Okay. All right. Another one. Oops. Try. Let's scoot down. Why don't we try? How about number? Let's go all the way down to number five. Walk through this one together. And these are supposed to be brackets. Ten seconds to start to kind of map it out in your head. Okay, what do we hit first on PEMDOS? Parentheses or grouping symbols, right? How many sets of grouping symbols do we see on the top? Three? Okay, if I've got a bunch of grouping symbols that are nested, meaning I've got groups inside of groups, when I'm going to simplify something complicated like that, where I've got nested grouping symbols, where do I start? Okay. Smallest one meaning what? Innermost, right? The ones that the one that's inside. Which one of these is, is the most inside? Okay, good. So I've got this absolute value part here, don't I? Right? So I've got the absolute value of negative 6 plus 2. Let's just focus on that. The absolute value of negative 6 plus 2. That right there might cause some problems. What's the answer to that? Okay, the answer is 4, right? But can you see how somebody could mistakenly get 8 out of that? What, what wrong step would someone make if they, if they concluded that was 8? Okay, they, you might think that because it's an absolute value, everything inside has to be turned positive. That's not the way it works, though, right? 
before we can actually take the absolute value, we have to combine everything in the middle, right? So inside of the parentheses, I've still got all this stuff that I have to do in order, right? So at the bottom here, it says add and subtract. So I've got to add negative 6 plus 2, which is negative 4, and then I can turn that into a positive. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, the absolute value bars, like any function in math, it doesn't care where the number is that you feed it. But if I feed it a number and it's positive, it leaves it alone. If it's negative, it makes it positive, right? But in order to feed it that number, we've got to do everything inside. We have to simplify everything inside the absolute value bars first to get that number, okay? So all this stuff just becomes a positive 4. Okay. So next step. So now we've got... 15 minus, in parentheses, we've got our 4. Plus the square root of 9, all squared, right, on the top. Okay, what's the next level of parentheses, or of grouping symbols? The parentheses. Okay, so inside the parentheses now, we've got to simplify all this stuff. So inside those parentheses, we're going to start at exponents and work our way down. So what's the first thing we're going to do inside this group of parentheses? Square root of 9. And you guys all know that, okay? How come? Where does, where does a square root show up on order of operations? What level is that? It doesn't seem to fit very well. Where does it go? It goes E. You're right. A square root goes there. Can you tell me why? I mean, what you might think, and this is okay for now, maybe you're thinking, okay, square, squaring something and square rooting something goes together because they undo each other. And that's fine. That's a good way to remember it, right? They, they would go together. But there's another reason for this. We'll talk more about this later, but I want to bring it to your attention because it makes this whole thing make more sense to you. If I have something like the square root of 9, can anybody tell me what number sits on that radical that we never write? 2. Yeah, square root is the same as a second root of 9. Okay, the second root of 9 is 3. Here's how we can do that then. We can write it as an exponent where we get 1 divided by whatever the index of the radical is. Whatever the number is that sits on the root or the radical, that goes on the bottom of a fraction. So, for example, what if I wanted to do the cube root of x? How could I write that as an exponent? x to the what? One third. Yep. Okay. We'll talk a lot more about that later. I'm just mentioning it now. We'll deal with it in more detail later. But you can see that definitely that makes it an exponent, right? So radicals go with exponents. So inside here we do the square root of nine is three, and then we combine those and we get seven, right? So we end up with we're working just on the top of the fraction now. I haven't even paid attention to the bottom yet. So on the top, we get 15 minus 7 squared, right? What's next? 15 minus 7 is 8. Okay, so we could replace all this stuff with an 8 squared is what? 64. Okay, so we got all three. I would actually argue that we missed one. There's another set of parentheses there that we don't write that goes around the entire numerator, like that. Like, how many sets of parentheses do you see on the bottom? Zero, but there is one implied because it's the bottom of a fraction, right? So we also know that grouping symbols means everything on the top of a fraction bar gets grouped, everything on the bottom gets grouped. So even though we don't write them, there's an implied invisible one right there, okay? So the top we get 64, what about the bottom? That's a little easier. So what, what are we going to get on the bottom here? 3 minus 3 cubed. I've got to do the 3 cubed first, right? 3 cubed is what? 27. What's 3 minus 27? Good. What's the rule for that? If I'm subtracting and combining a positive and a negative number, this goes way back to grade school, but it's a handy rule. How do you easily do that without having to think too much? 3 minus 27, what do you do? Good, good. Okay, so 
So you're going to always subtract the smaller number from the bigger one, right? So 27 minus 3 is 24, and then you keep the sign of the bigger number, so we keep the negative, right? And I, I don't mean to insult your math abilities here. I'm sure everybody is aware of that, but it's, these are just things, maybe you haven't done this stuff in a while. So on the bottom, we're going to get a negative 24. So there's our answer, but is that simplified? What do we do to simplify that? Just got to reduce the fraction. But what are some ways we can reduce the fraction? Okay, divide them both by a common divisor, common factor, right? So, for example, maybe you see, can anybody think of a big one that goes into both? Eight. Eight, we can do it in one shot if we, if we realize that eight goes into both of those, and we go right to our answer. But what if we didn't see that eight went into them? What, what could we do instead? We could just do this step by step in little smaller pieces. Yeah, divide by, for example, they're both even, right? So we could just divide both by two. So that's going to make this 32. It's going to make that negative 12. We do it again, right? They're both even. So I could make that a 16 and that a negative 6, and I could do it once more. They're both even, so I could divide the top by 2 and get 8. I could divide the bottom by 2 and get negative 3. So we're, that's pretty good, except what about that negative sign? For a fraction, do we want to leave the negative sign in the denominator? No, that's bad. We won't do that. It could go either out front or in the numerator. You never want to put it in the denominator. Right. So probably the best answer would just be negative 8 thirds. Right? Okay, calculators. These calculators do a lot of this stuff for you. I want to show you. So let's take this guy. So with the calculator, uh, the nice thing about these graphing calculators is I can make it look exactly like it does on paper. Right? So. So there it is, right? I want to do that. On my calculator, there's a bunch of, uh, there, I mean, you'll kind of get gradually more used to this. I'll show you a couple things about it right now. If I want to do, for example, a, a fraction template like that, if I want to make it actually look like a fraction with a fraction bar, I can do that. I can either go to the math menu or the math page. If I go to the math page, notice how this is organized on the calculator. If I scoot over to the right, every time one of these things is highlighted, that's its own menu. So this is the math menu inside the math page. It's got a bunch of stuff on there, some of which we'll use this year, some of which we won't. If I scoot to the right, I get the number menu inside the math page. So this is all the stuff we could do to numbers. We could take find a greatest common denominator, or least common multiple, or absolute value, right? If I keep scooting over to the right, there's some stuff about complex numbers that we won't see for about a month and a half. There's some probability stuff that we won't deal with a lot this year. Clear over to the right, there's a fraction template, or there's a fraction menu. And so here's how I can do things like I can convert fractions to decimals. Or for us, this is the one we'll use the most is the first one. I can use a fraction template. If I hit enter on that one, look what it does. It creates a fraction bar, and I can put stuff on the top separate from the bottom. It makes it look like it does on paper. The other way to get to that that's probably a little more handy, there's a shortcut on here. If I hit the alpha key, then I can go either alpha F1, F2, F3, or F4. And this one happens to be on the, the second one. So if I go alpha F2, oh, no, it's not. It's on the first one. It's alpha F1. It's right there. Okay, So that's a shortcut to it. And then I hit enter, and there I am. So now, what do I need to do here next? I need to put everything in brackets. Well, there are no brackets on the calculator. I have to just use parentheses. So I'm going to set up a set of parentheses, and then I've got a 15 minus the quantity. So I need another set of parentheses. Okay, here's an important one. Oh, absolute value. Where do I find that? It's on the math menu, but there's a shortcut if I go alpha F2, first option. They kind of put the most common stuff that's easy to get to. So either type 1 or enter, and there's my absolute value bars. Okay, here's one. What am I going to, if I want to put a negative 6 in there, what button do I push next? Okay, I got to push the negative button, right? This is the operation subtraction. When I'm, when I'm subtracting things, I use this, but if I've got a negative number, 
I have to use that one. Okay? So I get negative 6 plus 2. How do I get out of the absolute value bars now? Arrow. Hit the right arrow. It scoots me out of the absolute value bars. Plus, then I got to do square root. Well, that's on the front of the, of the calculator. Notice it's blue, so that means I've got to hit and it's above. So I got to hit the second. And then that button gives me a square root symbol. So I'm going to put the 9 in there. I'm going to, how do I get out of the radical? Arrow. Arrow. I got to close off that inside set of parentheses. And then I got to close off the other one that's a bracket. So I need another set of parentheses. And then I can either hit the caret symbol, bumps me up into an exponent. Like if I were going to cube this thing, I'd hit caret 3, right? But if I'm squaring it, there's a little shortcut I can do instead. There we go. Uh, if I'm squaring it, I can do it with one button push. I can just push the x squared button and it puts it to us. Okay. How do I get to the bottom of the fraction, obviously? Arrow down. Okay. And on the bottom, I want 3 minus 3 caret 3, right? Now watch what happens with this. I can put all that stuff in there, just like we see it. All I have to do is hit enter one time, and there's our negative 8 thirds. How cool is that? Okay. It's all in one place. So we out of here in one minute. Okay. So use that. Learn how to get some practice with your graphing calculators. But remember that you've got to be able to do it without them on the test, too. So don't do it all that way. Just get a little practice and check your answers. Okay? All right. We'll pick her up tomorrow.